Way back in 2008, Nintendo released a little number called Super Smash Bros. Brawl. And I don't have the original box for my copy, since I got it for around 15 bucks. So this fan-made one will have to do. Anyway, although the game is often panned by fans of the series these days, it was quite beloved when it initially debuted. So one guy looked at it and said, Hey, this Kirby guy. He's pretty cute. He and his friends ought to have their own comic series. And so Brawl and the Family began. Running from 2008 to 2014, the series included both strips uploaded directly to the Brawl and the Family site, as well as several songs which garnered a lot of popularity on YouTube. But all good things must come to an end, and oh hey look, they did, on October 2nd, 2014, when one final song was released. So, you're finishing up your long-running comic, have a huge fan base, musical, artistic talent, and a huge admiration for Nintendo? What do you do? You make a rhythm game that looks like it could have come straight from the beginning themselves. Tadpole Treble was kickstarted straight to Steam and the Wii U in 2016. Of course, Kickstarter games have been in the news quite a bit lately since A Hat in Time just came out, and what do you know, it's on the good side with Shovel Knight. Spoiler, Tadpole Treble is also on this side. And it has to be because of just how much of its own identity it has. After all, all the games here are brimming with originality. And all of the games over here, well, um, hmm. They just exist because someone lost the licensing rights. Featuring a wide array of genres and a simple but charming art style, this game might as well have been a straight continuation of the old Brawl in the Family animated songs. In fact, we'll get back to that later on. Let's get to the story already. Baton is a tadpole, and she certainly wasn't born yesterday. She was born today. I'm sorry, I'm pretty sure even the game makes that joke. I'll, I'll do better next time. Anyway, because she was born five seconds ago, the first level is clever, serving as a literal introduction to the world. Naturally, this first song is a simple, gentle tune, built to introduce you to the unique style of gameplay that separates this rhythm game from others. There's black notes to dodge, purple sparkles and bubbles to collect, health pickups, and even symbols to throw you through the air. There's also these bamboo sticks that you can whap at to add to the beat and net some extra points. It's a well-made tutorial as it has every single mechanic that will continue to pop up for the rest of the game, and introduces them at a slow pace with enough room for reaction. The twist here is that, in Tadpole Treble, the level layout is determined by the notes of the song. This may make it seem like the level should be pretty easy to dash straight through, but matters become more complicated when going for completion. Each level has five different criteria for 100% completion. If you want to do it all, you need simply finish the level, get both an S rank and an F rank, in separate runs of course, get all of the bubble collectibles, and complete a level specific challenge to receive a challenge fly. Some challenges include hitting objects and stages to the beat of the music, and clearing a level without taking damage. Speaking of which, this game is very generous with the number of hits you can take, and the number of health pickups you receive. But once more, these challenges completely change the routes you take through levels. You can take a fairly standard route for the S rank, and even the specific routes for all bubbles will often earn it. But F rank routes require you to know where every health pickup is, and where to purposely damage yourself to break multipliers. The challenge flies can have even more oddly specific paths, such as the one you get for not swimming through health pickups in the level with the most health pickups in the game. Anyhow, Baton reaches the end of the first level and gets eaten because I don't know, maybe her parents should have stepped in, hmm, yeah. Anyways, the cutscenes are all in this little comic sort of format, wink wink nudge nudge, and so Baton escapes to the top of the island. And so the epic journey began to travel, like, a mile, which is probably really long for a tadpole. Actually, I don't know. I'm not a tadpole. Not saying I wouldn't take someone up on the offer, that'd be mighty fishy. Stage 2 starts, and this one's got an epic sort of banjo kazooie -y sort of melody, always building up to those big notes and payoffs. This level also introduces the first non-note hazards, what with fish swimming everywhere, and the bear arm. Something tells me there's not actually a full bear attached to it. There's also this section about halfway through where the pace of the song completely slows up and it gets all like, oh, oh, here, here comes a boss battle. And then the giant fish just gets swiped up by the bear anyway. But it still sort of functions as a boss because it blocks off half the screen and limits your visibility. Speaking of which, in just another case of great game design, Baton is almost always to the far left of the screen. 
allowing you to see what's coming, making every mistake solely your own. Also, spotlights occasionally kick in. Probably the bear doing that. He looks like he'd be good with lights. On to stage three, and this one's sort of interesting because it has a kind of passive boss, one that may attack unintentionally rather than trying to fight you. A lot of enemies actually don't attack out of malice, rather there's sort of a circle of life natural instinct motivation going on here, which is an interesting decision to say the least. This level of course following its title is a waltz, and although it's not one of the most interesting, there's a lot of tempo changes to keep you on your feet, and some extra pathways to fling yourself upwards. Up next is the edgiest song in the game. <laughs> Cause it's 8-bit. It's got edges. I'm funny. Anyways, this stage is how you do a chip tune. It's extremely catchy and memorable, and however simple it is, it still succeeds in creating a variety of different sounds and rhythms. Extra points are in order for being able to slap the ducks in the face. Just down the river, night falls, and it's time for the first vocal track. That's right, a vocal track is in this game. I don't know why I found it so strange, the game just doesn't seem like it lends itself much to something like that, being a Nintendo-esque game, although... Even they haven't really kept instrumentals lately, what with them putting out the best single of all time a few months ago, and THE best, THE BEST BEST single of all time at the end of Mario Odyssey. If you haven't heard that one yet, uh, sorry. Spoiled it. Anyways, this is another new genre of music for the game. A suave love song sung by one lady killer of a tadpole. This level has even more rhythmic elements, from crabs snipping along with the music, to mosquitoes that you can whack right out of the air. This is one of the levels I find myself humming pretty often. This level also has a really cool design instance that I'd like to point out. There's this one section with some bubbles lined up on alternating staffs, and if you follow them, you and the other tadpole end up doing a bit of a dance right here, and I just thought that was kind of cool. Also, Patan should totally just settle down with this guy, they are literally the only two tadpoles with a thing for music, and he's heckin' cute. Then a bird happens. Lucky for Bataan, Etude shows up. He eats birds. He also gives out most of the game's completion bonuses, so we'll visit him again a little later. Next up is the obligatory horror level, which shouldn't even be possible in a rhythm game, but here we are. It starts out with a lot of ambience, and there's a lot of long drawn out notes and minor chords to make you feel dread of what's to come as you're chased by a vicious barracuda. There's also a lot of sudden jarring notes to almost give a jump scare sort of effect. All of this only holds true for about half of the song though. There's a really epic build up, and just as you discover the barracuda's weakness, the entire tone of the song changes to an upbeat piece with plenty of epic trumpets, some calmer flute portions, and even some fun vocals in the background that give off a sweet pirate vibe. The latter half of this song is actually really fun to sing and dance along to. Surprising, since this level is supposed to be the scary one. Of course, in stark juxtaposition, let's just go straight over to the most upbeat level in the game. That's right, it's time for an ice world, and I'll be hecked if it doesn't sound just like everything you come to expect from one. Right off the bat, bells start chiming, and an awesome violin part fills in. And of course, it's got plenty of those higher notes that Ice World seemed to be famous for, almost like someone just started pounding away on icicles like a xylophone, and, like, they could only play in a high octave. Now is probably a good time to mention I have no knowledge of music theory. The extent of what I can do is read sheet music. It's also worth noting that sleigh bells are always keeping time in the background, just in case you ever forgot that this was in fact an Ice World. But the song does get a bit of its own identity when a nice acoustic section mixes things up. The level also has some interesting new mechanics. Hitting the gongs here will often send Baton onto a sheet of ice before she slides back down into the water. I love little details like that. There's also some colder waters later in this level that will deal damage if you stay in them for too long, but this level also has approximately a bajillion health pickups. So yeah. Gusty Rapids is the next level, and I consider this to be the most forgettable song in the game. That said, it's very good, it just never pops in my head. It's got a flute part, I, I think it's a flute at least. I honestly have no idea what genre it is, but there's a few of them there. It sounds pretty nice, I'll leave it at that. The level is distinct for its mechanics, however, because it's backwards. 
Yes, the current here is very strong, so it's time to reprogram yourself to look to the left. The level also has a lot of cool temple architecture, with plenty of trap to dodge and even a giant boulder to outrun and whap back. This level ends, baton goes over the falls, credits roll. And so that was Tadpole Treble. Of course it's not actually over, the next level is a nice jazzy rhythmic piece with bouncy piranhas and man-eating plants. The kind that also sing. I guess. Having to dodge these fiendish fellows is really the only mechanic added here, but they do enough to keep things interesting. And this level has probably the hardest challenge fly in the game, not allowing you to hit anything. It's a worthwhile challenge and took me quite a bit of practice to get right. And now, time for the level you've all been waiting for! It's been here since the trailer, quite possibly the most epic folk tale ever written, Thunder Creek! Let me think about a little place called Thunder Creek. It's a rather shocking channel, so to speak. Yes, this level's gimmick is a folk song, and a pretty good one at that. Even better, it lets you know exactly how to beat the stage, or rather the snails that sing it do. This level introduces a lightning mechanic, that is, you're screwed if you're in the water when lightning strikes. Luckily, you'll be just fine if you just time your gong hits right. It's actually possible to get through the stage without leaving the water, a feat very helpful in netting another one of the game's F ranks. In addition, there's bones to crack open and crabs with aim assist to boot. This level is just genuinely enjoyable. Now, let's juxtapose that with the most depressing level in the game, Saltwater Cape. This is a level which sort of brings the game full circle, both in literal and metaphorical ways. It literally takes you back to Tadpole Pond, where you started, a level that was actually blocked off since you last cleared it, and metaphorically it's the return of the pelican. But Baton is ready to fight this time around. Throughout the level she'll be forced to break away from the pelican, just like she did at the very start of the game. Gets even worse though, this level takes place entirely in salt water, which will damage Baton if she's in it for too long. Thus, this entire level is about perfect cymbal hits, and it is so satisfying to stay up in the air for as long as possible. The music begins pretty dreary, but as soon as you start seeing stacks upon stacks of cymbals, things get crazy. Take a bow after this level, you've earned it. I'd like to take a moment right here for a spoiler warning, because the last level of the game is really something. Skip ahead if you don't want to see it, which I highly recommend if you have any intention of playing this game. So, Baton returns home, and it's in ruins, because of course it is, you'll leave for 10 seconds, Ugh. She and the pelican decide to put their differences aside to get stuff done. Oh, oh, someone's getting the Oscar for this. It's just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, a modern marvel. And so naturally, in the last level of this rhythm game about a tadpole, you have to fight a killer robot. The boss fight has its very own mechanics and is quite inventive with what's possible with this style of gameplay. The first phase has electrical wires to dodge and whap at. The second has a weird pizza cutter blade and an egg to hit. And the third phase has a lighter to hit right back at this technological terror. There's also bubbles hidden in between the notes in the first two phases, but getting them is the worst because the pizza cutter in phase two can block you out of getting them if you're not careful with how you bait it. But I could never really get angry with it. It was my fault after all. Another thing this stage gets right is the songs and how they mesh together. If you clear the fight as fast as possible, you'll always end a stage right before the song loops. But hold on, it gets better. Throughout this game, we've seen a multitude of genres. The final stage brings to table an eerie classic fight tune. A hard rock piece of sorts, but the final piece. Well, let me just remind you for a moment that this is in fact the guy who made songs like History of Nintendo, one final song, Ode to the Minions. So the final phase of this fight, the final song of this game, is a show tune. It's time to kick this party off, time to drop a couple of rhymes. It's time to sing another refrain. Yes, ma'am. If you want to join in, follow all the lyrics with your eye. But if you do so, make sure that you don't die. Okay, you see now? This is just the type of final boss I'd expect from a game like this. It's perfect.
But all is not well for Bataan. She saved everyone, but at what cost? Nah, she deus ex machina a pair of legs and doesn't even look back at the explosion. Cue the credits on an extraordinary piece remixing every song from the game, with additional vocals during the Thunder Creek section with some help from the Kickstarter backers. But it's not over yet, oh no, this game is a completionist dream. There's rewards for every objective, even achievements if you're playing the Steam version. I'm not gonna go over all of them, I'll just say that getting every challenge fly unlocks one more level. Of course, you'll also earn bestiary entries, level commentaries in marathon mode, and more importantly, composition mode. This mode allows you to make your own songs and gives the game limitless potential. Sadly, there's a few negatives to it. In both the Wii U and Steam versions, there is no way to share levels other than through QR codes. This allows levels to be cross-platform, but gets annoying quickly. There's also not a lot of user levels either. As of the time of this video, the Bitfinity website, one of the only places to get them, is down. You could always just convert your favorite MIDI files manually though, and even if you lack the patience for that, History of Nintendo is preloaded into the editor for your enjoyment. So finally, would I recommend it between the Steam and Wii U version? If your computer can run it, get the Steam version. Mine sucks and even it can do solid at 480p, but regardless, the Steam version is half the price of the Wii U version and occasionally goes on sale to around a ninth of the Wii U version's price. And it has achievements. Only get the Wii U version if you really want that authentic Nintendo feel and you're not sure how your computer will hold up against the game. Regardless, it's a quality game that is well worth your time. Pick it up if you're a fan of classic Nintendo fun, rhythm games, or even just Brawl in the Family. 